The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. I cannot in good conscience support a deal that punishes the United States, which is what it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if we go to the very end of the playbook, uh, to the year 2100, the currently best accepted uh, sea level rise forecast is 75 inches. So that's three inches above six feet. Many people say, what's the big deal six feet? Well, if you start out with six feet higher sea level and then put storms on top of it, you don't need a big sandy to flood the subway. You can do it with a 20-year storm instead of a 100-year storm. And so there is real estate available on the waterfront. Therefore, there's tremendous pressure to use this open, wireless open space. And that, of course, is in conflict with the very fact that sea level rise wants to occupy the same space that other folks want to develop. We learn things every day, in particular since we didn't have too many measurements and people that stayed in those regions where there is ice cover, namely in Greenland and, and Antarctica, in particular West Antarctic. Before we actually had instrumentation there, we simply took theoretical models, the global warming and how the air and the ice interact. But we didn't realize that when the ice melts there, the water has to go somewhere. And it goes into the crevasses and it lubricates the contact between the ice sheets and the rock. There are processes going on that could tremendously accelerate the rate in which the ice disappears in these ice-covered land areas. As we have seen in Sandy, we are currently vulnerable at the current sea level and with the current climate. Since we are still living and building actually new developments on the waterfront, that means we put more assets at risk. like a lot of other cities, has located its uh, infrastructures in very, very low-lying areas. Housing, residential development also like being near the coast. People like being near the coast. I think uh, New York City, just given its density um, and its low-lying location, uh, is uh, is more vulnerable. The sea level has been going up. And we've got a 500-plus mile coastline. 
and that's a lot of coast. <laughs> and we've, uh, it, it, there's more and more and more building along it. The city, starting with Mayor Bloomberg and with Mayor de Blasio, uh, have begun to galvanize uh, recognition and a plan and a strategy for the changing edge of a city like New York, um, the archipelago city. We are surrounded by water. But really, the, the public recognition, the industry's recognition of the challenge that sea level rise poses for New York, I don't think has really been part of the public discussion the way it needs to. Uh, Sandy, when you think about it, created $9 billion worth of damage to the, to the New York City economy. Sandy was one type of storm. There'll be another storm that's coming. But that level of economic consequences of storm surge, that's not even sea level rise, that's storm surge, calls into question what is the, the future of the city. And I think um, more and more uh, we have to recognize that without significant civic action by the city of New York itself, because I don't think the federal government will play the kind of significant financial role we need here in New York. So this is going to have to be solutions which come out of the local economy, out of the political will to reimagine the city's edge, because it won't stay the same. It will change. The tough reality is that every study that you look at in terms of climate change and sea level rise, none of them get any longer. No one says, oh, the last study said 100 years. I'm saying 200 years. Every single credible study almost cuts the last study's time frame in half, and that's a call to action. The city um, commissioned uh, and set up an organization called the New York City Panel on Climate Change a few years ago. A group of academics from regional institutions, world-renowned experts in the fields of climate science. They've done projections uh, into the 2020s, the 2050s, the 2080s, and have even taken some of the projections out to 2100. Um, we're using as a planning horizon uh, for much of our work the 2050s, and we're expecting to see one to two feet of sea level rise in the mid-range, as high as two and a half feet. Um, temperatures are going to increase. We're going to see higher precipitation in New York City, a uh, higher likelihood of uh, flooding events. We've already seen a foot of sea level rise in New York City since 1900. Some of the most visible things that uh, people are interested in is our coastal defense program. And we're investing against uh, sea level rise, and we launched an, an over $100 million program called Raise Shorelines, where we're looking at the most vulnerable, low-lying areas and upgrading our coastal defenses there. Uh, then there's been a couple high-profile projects um, that have come out of the Rebuild by Design competition. When Sandy hit, we were really at a place of having zero coastal defenses um, in any measurable way. And we've been taking uh, the last several years to really turn on that program and begin investing. So the competition started a few months after Hurricane Sandy. HUD wanted to do something a little bit different than they normally do. They wanted to take some of the disaster recovery funds and set aside it for a design competition that would think about really big ideas of how we want to see our communities and our cities in the future. One of the big winners was the Big U. It was originally awarded $335 million by the federal government to go to New York City to implement the project. So the Big U is going to go from 25th Street and it's going to wrap all the way around Lower Manhattan. As you can see, this is East River Park and it's flat. And in a few years from now, it's not going to look like this. It's going to have a lot of hills and berms, which will do a couple of things. One of which it will stop the surge from coming in and it will absorb water from rainwater. So the, the designs are all meant to be adaptable for the future. So what we build now will hopefully be able to be built upon as sea level rise gets higher and higher. AECOM is the lead consultant on that project. Some of those ideas might be really dramatic, you know, really, really dramatic. Right now that project potentially is anywhere from two to three billion dollars, just roughly. We haven't, we're just right at the beginning of it, but we have $179 million from Senator Chuck Schumer to help fund that. Kudos to Chuck for getting that done, but there's a big gap there. So we need to understand growth, value, uh, revenue, and at the same time, strategies that are not simply just saying, here's the new Berlin Wall, which I think Brooklyn is somewhat stuck, stuck with right now. It's a very static approach to keeping uh, the sea level rise out of Brooklyn. It's virtually a wall that just rings uh, the Brooklyn waterfront. 
that's not an environment that I think New Yorkers want to live in, being separated by you know, such a barrier from you know, the waterfront, which makes the city so great. So yes, we are working on Lower Manhattan. We think it's a major, major work in progress. Uh, and there are people who are going to probably see and hear a lot of different ideas rather than simply just a sort of armoring of Lower Manhattan under the big U. I think a key lesson for New Yorkers is that we're never going to be climate proof, but what we're doing is getting climate ready. And by implementing our multi-layered resiliency program, uh, we're improving neighborhoods, we're upgrading our building codes, our zoning codes, we're improving the way we, um, the buildings that we live in. Uh, we're also working to minimize the risk from the coast uh, and investing against sea level rise and, and climate change and coastal storms. Um, all of that together is, is really adding up to a, a stronger and more resilient New York. You know, there are regulations, unfortunately, some of those uh, come after the fact. The NYU Medical Center uh, felt something like uh, close to 14 feet of storm surge, and it wrecked the, uh, a lot of the facilities, took well over $100 million to, um, to repair. I think it's a start. I think it's a, it's a, a start to a Sandy-like occurrence where you're looking at people armoring, strengthening their buildings, dealing with moving generators, um, building floodgates within their building to protect them, strategies which are largely designed in response. They are not strategies which are designed um, in anticipation. They're not long-term strategies for uh, a fundamental change in geography and a fundamental change in the city's edge. That concerns me. That really is... Uh, the challenge we have. I think we've done a good job of uh, responding, but I don't think we've really begun to think about how do we deal with a change of one, two, you know, up to six feet of water rise. Uh, it's going to have to be dealt with, and it's not just a response, it's really an anticipation. This project from the beginning uh, was thought about as um, an environmentally, wanting to be an environmentally sound project. Sims actually suffered minimal damage during the storm. It was only wind damage that they actually sustained and no flooding damage. Meanwhile, the pier next door, which had 20,000 cars on the lot, were basically went bankrupt the next year because all of its cars were inundated and flooded. Rising water has been a conversation before Sandy. You know, the Dutch and you know, talk about it all the time. Um, and it was always in conversation about climate change. Sandy was the kind of exclamation mark in this whole thing. Um, and they were foreseeing, you know, the trajectory early on. And they were uh, yeah. advantageous in doing so. This is the, actually a, a photo of the site during construction. Um, and you can see on the, in the photo on the right, the left-hand side, there's a perimeter wall, concrete perimeter wall. That was used to raise the site up. And within that, there's basically 5,000 tons of recycled glass product that's used. Uh, in tandem with uh, mole rock from New York City uh, tunnel. tunnel projects, i.e. the Second Avenue subway tunnel. So there's 20,000 tons of uh, mole rock that's used uh, mixed with the re recycled glass aggregate, and that's what that was. That's what that's mainly what's left was used. The, 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 the pier up four feet above the FEMA floodplain at the time. To the MTA's credit and the Port Authority and the PATH system, major, major capital investment has been spent doing the kind of protection that uh, works today. You know, they've come up with strategies of inflatable balloons, bladders that will immediately, like almost like a passenger airbag, will like immediately pop and seal an opening. And they've looked at uh, uh, sea barriers that will drop down. But, you know, these are all costs that are stressing a system which already is stressed. You look at the incredible amount of money that the High Line, for example, brought into New York for all that improvement over there. That was a catalyst for you know the de Blasio administration to, to spend a lot of the money that that created, that, those, that tax base. We need to think about other initiatives that create value, that create communities, that create wealth to pay for things we've never ever had to think about before.
I was part of a study out of Washington DC, uh, congressionally mandated. It was coming up with the result that for every one dollar you spend in mitigating these kind of risks, you get back about four dollars in not incurred losses. That sounds to me a pretty good bargain. There's a long-term issue here that even with all the efforts that New York City government and New York State government and to some degree the federal government is putting in, in setting policies that prime us for climate change, we still don't think long-term. To do more development on the waterfront may be fine for the next 20 or 30 years, but it will be a real serious problem for our grandchildren to have all that new stuff on the waterfront, and not just in the waterfront, but in the water. And that's the problem we are not willing to face up to yet. But we are not planning this city to get ready for the conditions of the year 2100 and beyond. The concept that has come out of the New York City panel on climate change is what we call flexible adaptation pathways. And it's, um, you know, we don't need to plan for the ultimate end state of what the world's going to look like in the year 2500 today. We need to take the steps that we can take now, and we're planning, we have a natural planning horizon um, into the 2050s and even beyond in some cases. And what that allows us to do is um, do uh, what we can now with what we have, but know that we're going to build on that. And some of our projects are being built with that adaptation uh, pathway in mind that we're going to be able to continue to build on them uh, and continue to monitor the, the true impacts of climate change as they come. And we may need to make different decisions in the future, but we're setting up uh, you know, the next generation to be able to make those choices. We're doing what we can with what we have now, uh, in, I think, in a climate smart way. There is no free right to climate change. We had a free right the last 100, 150 years by getting cheap fossil fuel. Well, now we are starting to pay for it. No, the only thing I can think of is, I think we should start to think a little bit more about our grandchildren, and not just about ourselves. And that is an ethical and moral issue, it's not a financial issue. But that attitude, if we only think about ourselves, will make it much, much, much harder for future generations to deal with the mess that we create now.